Alexandra with New Mexico Historic Sites and welcome to the Mesilla Plaza here in southern New Mexico. Mesilla is a very special community and this plaza has been the centerpiece since the town's founding in the late 1840s. Now there are so many interesting stories about Mesilla and the surrounding communities that I'd like to be able to share with you. As you can see, I've got my mask on today and following all of my COVID safe practices, um, but I am gonna go ahead and take my mask off because I do wanna be able to share with you one of those stories today. The story I'd like to tell you today is one of religion and politics, contentious topics throughout history, which resulted in a deadly riot right here on this plaza in August of 1871, a riot which ultimately led to a community breakup. The riot is considered one of the bloodiest days in territorial New Mexico history. At least nine people died and more than 35 were injured. And in the fallout, over 500 citizens of Southern New Mexico communities, including Mesilla's own parish priest, Father Jose de Jesus Baca, left New Mexico and crossed our Southern border back into Mexico. It all began on November 16, 1854, when troops from Fort Fillmore marched onto this plaza, removed the Mexican flag, and replaced it with the American flag, formalizing the shift in governmental power that had taken place 11 months earlier with the signing of the Gadsden Purchase in Mexico City. Father Baca had been watching Americans move into New Mexico throughout the 1850s and then at the end of the American Civil War in 1865. He was very concerned about the mixing of Catholics and Protestants in the region, especially in nearby Las Cruces. Though he was in charge of all the major parishes in southern New Mexico, his residence was here in Mesilla, where he felt very closely connected to the largely Mexican community and became heavily involved in local politics. He distrusted Democrats, comparing them to land-hungry Texans, and regularly encouraged his parishioners to vote Republican. His political leanings were the result of years of land-grant fights, which had been brewing for decades. The recording of Mexican land grants was different than the recording of American property deeds. And according to local historian Mary Daniels Taylor, the recording of deeds in the Mesilla civil colony was sometimes never recorded in the courthouse until a transaction of some kind took place, whether it be buying, selling, or mortgaging. And if none of these actions took place, then people usually just kept their original documents in a drawer or a trunk. Sometimes they might misplace it or lose it entirely, at which point there was no record of the sale of deed. For many Mexicans, this meant their land prior to 1854 remained their land after 1854. A stipulation in the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo even provided protection for those property rights. This wasn't the case, however, as Americans had long lived under a system where land grants were formalized through lawyers and the government and property ownership had record. Where land wasn't formally claimed, such as in plots that were set aside for community use or where deeds had yet to be formalized, some citizens of Doniana County found their definition of property ownership a big problem. In March of 1871, community leaders, both Anglo and Hispanic, met to try and come up with a solution to put an end to the land grabbing and squatting that had been a problem since the signing of the Gadsden Purchase. Community leaders hoped to find an agreement that would allow Maciados the ability to keep their land and formalize their property rights in the eyes of the American government. It was necessary without delay to put the proper and pertinent documents in the hands of lawyers to assure titles. This brings us back to Father Baca, who throughout the summer had been arguing from both his pulpit and in newspapers that voting for the Democratic ticket meant a loss of not only personal property, but also religion. He said that Catholicism was intrinsically tied to what it meant to be Mexican and that Democrats, Texans, and Americans did not act in the best interest of the community. He felt that Republicans would better protect Maciero's property rights and the church. All of this ultimately served to magnify a feeling of distrust and unease within the community. That year, Jose M. Gallegos and J. Francisco Chavez were vying for the New Mexico Territory's singular seat in Congress. It was an important position despite being a non-voting seat. This leads us to August 27, 1871. On that day, both the Democratic and Republican parties held rallies right here on this plaza for the upcoming election. The rallies were full of passion, both sides had a band whose music pervaded the whole plaza and the alcohol flowed freely. Soldiers from nearby Fort Selden had been dispatched earlier in the day to monitor the situation, knowing there had been heightened political tensions both in Mesilla and Doniana County. However, seeing as events were calm, they decided to return back to Fort Selden, 20 miles to the north. Throughout the day, the two parties continued to circle one another as they marched through the streets of Mesilla until they came to a standoff here, in front of what was once the Reynolds and Griggs storefront. As the shouting grew and each party's band increased its volume in an attempt to outbid one another, the two groups collided and a shot rang out above the crowd. 
Republican John Lemon, who lived here on the plaza south end, had been arguing with newspaper man and Democrat I.N. Kelly. When the first shot rang out, Kelly struck Lemon over the head with a blunt weapon. Now Republicans argue that Kelly's attack was unprovoked, but Democrats say that Lemon goaded Kelly and threatened to attack him, so Kelly acted in self-defense. Regardless of the motivations, in retaliation, Lemon's friend Felicito Arroyas y Luceres shot and killed Kelly. Arroyas himself was shot and killed soon after, and violence erupted across the plaza. Panic set in as mass was ending over at San Albino on the plaza's north end, and parishioners exited the service to find their community in chaos, with stray bullets and fists flying through the air and people trampling one another in an attempt to escape. Seven-year-old Teresita Garcia, whose grandfather Antonio Garcia was a horn player in one of the bands, had been watching the rallies from where she played at the steps of the church. She got frightened when the shouting began and started running for home, but this is when the shooting began. She turned just in time to see her grandfather and his horn go down. He miraculously survived. His horn did not. But could you imagine what this scene must have been like for a child? Buildings on both the east and the west side of the plaza became central gathering locations for both sides of the fight, as well as for protection for the innocent bystanders who were unable to get to their homes safely. This included Mariano Borella's home right here. He was actually a candidate in the election for county sheriff. It is said that within 15 minutes, 500 bullets were fired. A messenger was dispatched to bring the soldiers back from Fort Selden. That evening, a contingent from the 8th Cavalry returned with orders to end the fighting and restore peace. According to Mary Daniels Taylor, it is at this point that most Macieros felt it safe enough to exit their homes and carry away their dead and wounded. It is around the same time the soldiers arrived that John Lemon, the first injured in the melee, died. We know from newspaper accounts that at least nine people died and more than 35 were injured in this riot. Newspapers speculated that Father Baca's influence as a Republican and the fact that the initial attack that started the violence was against Republican John Lemon would spell doom to Democrat Jose Gallegos' campaign. This was not to be the case, as Gallegos ultimately won the election. Though the soldiers had brought peace, the damage had been done. A significant portion of Mesilla, mostly Republicans, decided that they no longer wanted to live in Mesilla and left shortly after the riot to found La Ascension in the Mexican state of Chihuahua. By the following year, 100 families, over 500 people, had moved from New Mexico to Chihuahua. This included not only Mesieros, but former residents of other southern New Mexico communities, including Las Cruces, Chambarino, Santo Tomas, and La Mesa. In July of 1872, citizens of La Ascension petitioned the Diocese of Durango requesting that Father Baca be transferred from San Albino to their new parish. 490 out of the 500 citizens of La Ascension signed that petition. Former New Mexico State historian Rick Hendricks suggests that it was more than just political tensions that caused this mass exodus. He writes that these former New Mexicans probably felt moved to relocate to the ecclesiastical province of the Diocese of Durango and felt that they would rather take their chances in Mexico than in the politically violent climate of the United States. The first to sign that petition was Blas Duran, a former Mesilla resident whose home still stands here on the north side of San Albino. Father Baca remained at San Albino until April of 1873 when he then transferred to La Ascension. New Mexico remained a territory of the United States for over 60 years before being granted statehood in 1912. There were a variety of reasons for this, but this moment in history certainly played into that. Americans felt New Mexico was a lawless land where the bullets ran wild and the blood spilled freely. This community would never be the same. It lost a portion of its population as well as its parish priest. Today, the community of La Ascension in Chihuahua is actually a sister city to Mesilla and the plaza remains quiet. But the riot of 1871 has remained in the community's collective memory.